I'm Kathleen Stringer. I'm a faculty member in the College of Pharmacy. I work with the MRC2, and I am director of the NMR Metabolomics Laboratory that is in the College of Pharmacy. And I'm going to talk a little bit about NMR metabolomics this afternoon, and in particular, talk about how NMR and LCMS approaches can complement each other and be quite informative. So I'm going to just give you a, a very brief overview about NMR metabolomics. Um, I, full disclosure, I'm not an NMR spectroscopist, so I don't have the background and knowledge in NMR chemistry. Um, I work with someone who does, so if you have any specific questions that I can't answer, I'd be happy to refer you to her. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about some of the capabilities of NMR for metabolite uh, detection and the approaches that we've been using here at the University of Michigan, and then give you some examples of some of the work that we've been doing, most of which is, is some has been published and some is ongoing. Um, and in particular, as I mentioned, talk about the cross-analytical um, applications of NMR and LCMS. So um, NMR is one of the several analytical platforms that can be used for uh, metabolomics, as you've, you've heard throughout the last few days. Um, and like LCMS, it is applicable to virtually any type of sample that you can generate. Blood, urine, cerebral spinal fluid, broncholavage fluid, um, any type of uh, biofluid that you can assay by LCMS, you can certainly also assay by NMR. Um, the primary disadvantage of NMR is that it's not as sensitive as LCMS. So we uh, typically measure metabolites in the micromolar range. And depending on the type of sample, we can detect and quantify anywhere between 40 and 70 metabolites. Urine, in particular, is very metabolite rich. Um, so we can push the 70 and maybe even get to 80 or 85 metabolites in urine. Unlike LCMS, NMR is routinely quantitative with a single internal standard. It's highly reproducible, so when we run NMR here at the University of Michigan and we send our samples or technical replicates to the University of Alberta in Edmonton, we can reproduce our data. So that's, that is a nice advantage of NMR. And the other thing about NMR is that it's non-destructive to the sample, and, and we've been working uh, with the, the MRC2 to um, use samples that we've run by NMR and then send them right to LCMS. So that's, that's a nice advantage that you can get NMR data and then get LCMS data from the same, same sample. So just a little, little review about the principle of how NMR metabolomics works. Historically, NMR has been used for single compound uh, work, and the idea behind using NMR for metabolomics is that at least in particular proton NMR, is that every hydrogen-containing compound has a unique NMR signature. And in a mixture of compounds, we can identify the individual compounds within that mixture. So that really allows us to identify a number of different compounds as well as be able to quantify them as well. I just want to say a few things about sample collection. I know that you've heard about that already for LCMS. Uh, essentially, the principles are the same for NMR. There are some minor differences. Um, one is that serum in itself is a, is a great cross-platform biofluid because there's no preservative in that sample, and so we can take a serum sample, run it in NMR, and also run that same sample or a technical replicate in LCMS, and it's, it's fairly straightforward. Um, where things can get a little murky is uh, we, we like heparin-preserved plasma and whole blood for NMR, and that can be somewhat problematic. Uh, for LCMS, although Charles and I have been working a little bit on trying to remedy that, so it's actually getting better. Um, and we're, we're advocating actually the use of whole blood now for metabolomics. Um, I'm not going to go into those details right now, but if you, if you have any questions or interest in whole blood metabolomics, I'd happy to talk to you about that. Um, regarding, though, heparin use, um, just some things to keep in mind. Uh, we do prefer sodium heparin uh, rather than lithium he heparin glass over plastic, and just keep in mind that if you are using those vacutainer tubes, which are commonly used in the clinic, 
The heparin in those tubes is not endotoxin free. So expeditious handling of your blood collection um, samples and your samples in general for metabolomics, uh, keep those samples cold and handle them quickly. So we recommend that if you are collecting samples into a vacutainer type um, tube that you immediately put them into an ice water bath so that they stay cold. Um, one of the other differences between NMR and LCMS is that we need a little bit larger sample volume. So we like 500 microliters um, of sample. We can run lower samples. I'll talk to you about how we run our samples and why we need that sample volume. Um, but typically, there is a larger sample volume required for uh, NMR. And as I'm, I'm sure you've heard, whenever possible, generate technical replicates um, in addition to biological replicates. So for NMR that we do here at the University of Michigan, we routinely use a methanol chloroform extraction process. Um, in cases where you have small sample volumes, less, less than or equal to about 200 microliters, you can run NMR without any type of processing um, and removal of macromolecules. Um, but there are some, some problems with that, and, and I'll, I'll show you why that can be problematic. Um, this only really allows you to get water-soluble profiling done. Um, and the primary problem is that you have, because you have macromolecules in your sample, it really does not allow you to get a nice, clean spectrum from your sample. Um, and that's uh, primarily shown here. You can see that the baseline on this spectrum, we call them the, the humps or the mounds, um, do not allow for a nice smooth ba baseline, so we can't quantify uh, those metabolites. Now, we, we can get some information from this type of spectrum. We can uh, name those metabolites, identify the metabolites, but we can't quantify them. And I'll show you some of the uh, analytical or analysis processes that we can use to get data from a spectrum like this. But um, if, if, there's, if you have an optimal sample volume, we can get rid of those macromolecules and get a much better spectrum. Um, so from something like this, we can't get any lipid information and we can't get any quantification. So what we do is we use a methanol chloroform extraction. There are certainly advantages and disadvantages to this, but the primary advantage is, is, is that it generates an aqueous phase and a lipid phase. And NMR is very good for aqueous metabolites. It's not great for lipid metabolites. So you take those lipids out of your sample, um, and that sample can be reserved for LCMS, use on the untargeted lipid, lipidomics platform here at the MRC2, or any other type of lipid assay that might, you might want to do. Um, and then we add an internal standard, and that allows us to accurately um, process the spectrum, and then identify and quantify metabolites. And we use a platform, a software platform called Konomics. It is a commercial uh, software, so it is expensive. It costs money. Um, but I think it's fair to say that it's probably one of the most reliable and um, detailed. It has, a, it has a, about a 360 compound library uh, for NMR metabolomics. So, um, that is what we're using to identify and quantify metabolites in our NMR spectrum. Um, right now, they only have an aqueous metabolite library. They don't allow for quantifying lipid metabolites. Um, we're actually approaching them to try to fix that, to do maybe some work with them to, to build a, a lipid library for NMR metabolomics. So this is, this is just a schematic of what you end up with. Um, the methanol chloroform extraction um, does take some time, and it does take some equipment to do. Um, it does get rid of the macromolecules. So as you can see from the, the spectra here, that you get this nice, uh, smooth baseline. So that just allows us to, to be more accurate in our ability to identify and quantify uh, metabolites. And then it does allow you for this dual platform assay. So with the aqueous phase, we'll, we'll run that by NMR, and then we will reserve the lipid phase for either targeted lipid assays or uh, untargeted lipid assays that you might want to do later or in, in parallel with the aqueous phase. Um, the disadvantage is that it is time consuming. It does take about 
24 hours to generate the uh, two phases and have them ready for assay. And of course, you, you are going to lose some metabolites just by the fact that you're precipitating out macromolecules. Some metabolites will go, will go with those compounds. Um, and so you have, have the lipid phase and the aqueous phase. And, and this lipid phase is, once you get to that final point, um, it can be stored in a, in a glass tube with a special uh, screw top, and we parafilm that, and we store that at minus 20. And our experience has been is that's a very stable sample that can be stored long term. Um, we store our hydrophilic uh, samples. We run them right when we generate them, and then we reserve them in a minus 80 after we run them. So the workflow for NMR metabolomics is very, very similar to the LCMS uh, workflow. Um, the first and very important step is sample acquisition and handling. Um, how you collect your samples really is ultimately going to reflect the quality of your data. The sample preparation for, for how we do our, our work here is a methanol chloroform extraction, with the exception of urine, which does not require extraction process. Um, and then the assay itself, and then um, we send it to Alla and George for analysis. So they, you know, they also have the expertise. The data sets are not as, as elaborate, um, not as many metabolites, but um, all, the, all the things that you've heard about data analysis um, from George and Alla uh, over the last few days do apply to NMR data sets as well. So in, in, in a very broad sense, that's the workflow, and that's the workflow that that um, you follow for LCMS as well. So this is just a representative spectrum uh, from NMR. The x-axis is, it's, I know it's hard to read, but it's, it's a chemical shift part in parts per million. Um, there's an internal standard. And when you have this, you generate the spectrum, there's a, there's a couple different ways that you can approach how you analyze the spectrum. You can quantitatively analyze the data, and that involves um, using the Konomic software and identifying and quantifying metabolites from your spectra in that, plat in that uh, software platform. Um, or you can do something called a chemometric analysis in which you utilize um, what's called a binning approach or bucketing approach. And that involves um, also the use of some software, usually software that's available as part of the NMR um, analytical software, the acquisition software. It can be done, um, but essentially what you do is you tell the software that you want to designate a fixed area across the spectrum. For example, like 0 0.04 ppm, and, and you're going to create essentially buckets across the entire spectrum and calculate uh, the area within that each bucket. And so what gets generated is an area, numbers of buckets, whatever you uh, determine across your spectrum, you may have 50 buckets, and you'll get an uh, integrated area from the spectrum across all those buckets. And then you can compare your different groups. And this is just a, a fictitious kind of fantasy data set where uh, you have acute lung injury and healthy people and patients with sepsis, and you can use principal component analysis to just look to see, are there differences across these three groups? And that typically says, yes, these three groups are different. Now, if you want to identify what metabolites or what regions of the spectrum may be driving those changes, you can go back to your bucket data and actually still treat those buckets um, as individual data points and do statistical analysis on those and identify which buckets are different from another and then look within those spectral regions to find which metabolites are most likely responsible for those differences. Also, it can, uh, like a chemometric analysis does not preclude you from going on to do a quantitative analysis. So for example, if you just are doing an initial survey and you're not really sure if group A and group B are going to be different, but you find by PCA something dramatic like this, it probably is worthwhile to just quantify your spectra and get the quantified data and, and do a full statistical analysis to, to find out which quantitatively which metabolites are different across your groups. So those are just some examples of, 
of how spectra can be analyzed. So I wanted to give you some kind of, I'm, I'm talking about vignettes from the field, so I want to give you some real life experiences about um, how NMR and targeted LCMS can, can work together. Um, we've been involved in a project looking at age-related deep vein thrombosis, which is a clinical problem um, because as we all get older, the risk of DVT or deep vein thrombosis increases. And it's not really clear why that is, what the underlying pathological mechanism is for that. Um, there is some evidence to suggest that there may be a metabolic reason um, for some of that risk. And so what we did is we did a small study in some patients. Serum samples were collected from some young patients with DVT and some older patients with DVT. And we did a, a NMR metabolomic study on those samples assaying the aqueous phase. And we identified 38 metabolites in those samples. And then we found that there were three metabolites that seemed to be different um, between the two groups. And these were carnitine, choline, and betaine TMAO. Um, on an NMR spectrum, it's sometimes difficult to separate betaine and TMAO. Um, they're very close. Um, so we kind of grouped them together. And what we did is we sent um, technical replicates of these samples to the MRC2 LCMS lab and asked them to do a targeted assay to see if we were, are we in the ballpark? Are we, are we on track of, of these metabolites being um, the ones that we should go after? And these are the LCMS data, which essentially reproduced very nicely our NMR data. Um, so this is just one application where, you know, you could take a kind of the 20,000 foot view using NMR, and then you can substantiate your data using a targeted assay. Um, and because LCMS is more sensitive, um, we were able to differentiate the two, the two compounds by LCMS. So that's just one example of how NMR and LCMS can work together. Another project involves um, something that's a little more complex, not that DBT isn't complex, but um, we're um, working with a group at the University of Mississippi who is is working on some therapeutic um, approaches towards treating sepsis. And um, for this project, we're um, assaying serum samples that were collected from sepsis patients. And for those of you who may not be familiar with sepsis, which is bacteria in the blood, it is um, a very significant hazard to human health. Um, it is responsible for 500,000 deaths in the United States each year and is particularly an illness of the elderly. As we get older, we're more susceptible to, to sepsis. Um, sepsis is really challenging um, because it's known to cause a large perturbation in energy metabolism and in particular mitochondrial function. So it, it really causes this large metabolic shift um, but one of the challenges has been that we really don't have effective treatment despite this huge and serious change in metabolism and certainly the critical level of illness that these patients have. And this is in part due to the fact that patients with sepsis are very heterogeneous. Um, it's very difficult to know when someone presents who may seem mildly to moderately ill that in fact that patient may indeed have sepsis or whether or not that patient is going to get really sick really fast or whether that patient could die within hours. So it's a really clinical, clinically challenging problem. And because the group of patients is so different, clinical trials that have tested therapies haven't been able to differentiate that severity. So all these different types of patients end up in the clinical trials and it's kind of a muddled mess in the end, the, the, the therapy hasn't really been shown to be effective. So we're trying to use metabolomics to help solve that problem. And one of the um, potential uh, therapeutic approaches to sepsis is, is, is something called L-carnitine. L-carnitine is an endogenous compound, and it's presently used as a supplement in patients with renal dysfunction because they tend not to absorb and have enough carnitine, which they need 
for proper mitochondrial function. So because it's important in mitochondrial function, it may have therapeutic benefit in sepsis. So um, we've been working with uh, this group, as I mentioned, at the University of Mississippi, and they conducted a phase one study which just assessed, is this drug safe? Is this supplement safe in sepsis? Is it okay to use in sepsis? Um, and as part of that study, they collected serum samples, and we assayed those samples um, by NMR, and we were able to m metabolically differentiate survivors and non-survivors. And so what we did is we found that the baseline metabolome, so these patients had a blood sample that was collected early in the course of sepsis at the time they presented to the emergency department, and we found that there were a number of metabolites that were, were different at that very early stage of sepsis between patients who ended up surviving and those who did not survive. And um, those included 3 hydroxybutyrate and acetoacetate, which are ketone bodies, 3-hydroxyisovalerate, um, uh, creatine, and actually the acetylcarnitine carnitine ratio. Acetylcarnitine is a, a metabolite of carnitine, and this ratio is often used to describe carnitine homeostasis. And in patients who, who ended up not surviving sepsis, they had a higher ratio, suggesting that they might have more disruption in their carnitine mitochondrial balance, if you will. But we also um, found that in patients who were treated with carnitine, that there were some striking differences in the levels of carnitine. So these are patients, all of whom got the same dose of carnitine. There was no difference in their renal function. And I, I kind of uh, freaked out for a moment when I was looking at these data because these patients supposedly got carnitine and their levels were down around the ranges of the placebo-treated patients. And I had to call my collaborator in Mississippi and said, I think maybe some of your carnitine-treated patients didn't get carnitine. But indeed, they did. So there were a group of patients, and it was actually about half of the, the patients, they were equally split, that had, had lower, this profoundly lower level of um, carnitine levels that were in the range of the placebo-treated um, patients, um, compared to patients who had a much higher level of carnitine, and this is after carnitine treatment. And when we looked at the, how these patients did long term, is we found that patients who had these higher levels of carnitine, 38% of these patients died compared to 13% um, of the patients who had lower levels of carnitine. And so we categorized these patients as carnitine non utilizers and utilizers, um, just for the purpose of kind of a dichotomous grouping of these patients. But these data suggest that maybe there is something to the mitochondria and their ability to utilize carnitine that may be synonymous with, with outcome. And notably, at time zero, at that early treatment point, there were no differences in the carnitine levels of these patients. And in placebo patients, their carnitine levels did not change at all. So as you might imagine, carnitine metabolism is complicated and involves a lot of steps. But one of the important parts is the transport or shuttling of long-chain fatty acids from the systemic circulation into the mitochondria. And one of the surrogates, if you will, of that process is the generation of <coughs> acylcarnitines. We can't measure acylcarnitines by NMR, so I'm working with Charles Evans in the MRC2 to measure these by LCMS. And what we found was is that in a, in a carnitine utilizer, and these are very preliminary data, I will, I will say, but in a carnitine utilizer, similar to carnitine levels, much lower than compared to a non-carnitine utilizer. So again, just another example of how NMR data um, give us that initial view of what might be going on metabolically and how LCMS allows us to drill down to maybe what some of these mechanisms might be at, at that level. And just another little, you know, shout out for the, the good correlation between NMR and LCMS data. These are actually the acyl carnitine to carnitine ratios 
from both LCMS and NMR showing great correlation across the two platforms. So these were nice reproducible data across both, both platforms. So these preliminary data um, from this study, which is ongoing, suggest that L-carnitine uh, pharmacometabolomics could give us some insight into metabolically phenotyping and differentiating sepsis and phenotyping these patients possibly long-term for clinical trials and differentiating these patients for enrollment in those types of trials. Um, we're in the process of getting ready to uh, embark on the samples that are being generated from the phase two trial, which is a much, much larger trial. The phase one trial is only about a 30 patient trial. The phase two trial is a 250 patient trial. So we're hoping to, to begin to assay those um, samples soon. And for that work, we, we plan to use both LCMS and uh, NMR together to generate an untargeted complementary data set and then we'll use a targeted uh, acyl carnitine assay for um, looking at uh, the long chain fatty acid utilization and carnitine utilization. So in summary, I, I hope I've given you some insight into the utility of, of proton NMR and, and what NMR can do and how it can be used as both a standalone tool and in complement with LCMS and some different um, types of LCMS assays. Um, and I think that, like LCMS, the, the role of NMR in metabolomics is rapidly evolving. We do single dimensional for this type of work, but we can do more elaborate, what's called two dimensional NMR to get more structural information about compounds. Um, I think um, there's a great opportunity to use NMR and LCMS as complementary platforms to gain additional metabolic data across samples and in studies. Um, and if you're interested in, in NMR metabolomics, we'd be happy to help you or answer any of your questions. Thank you so much for your attention. I'd be happy to answer any of your questions now. Thank you. Hoshi. So um, how, how many interstandards are normally used in MRI study? One. Just one. So it's just one. So you have two. Uh, after extraction, you have two phases, right? Anchorage phase, lipid phase. Um, we don't run the lipid phase by NMR, though. Right now, we're not doing that. For aqueous metabolites, we add a single st internal standard. And really, what that standard allows us to do is to process the spectrum, align it properly, and use, use it as a quantitative benchmark so that when we go into Konomic software, we use the chemical shift to identify compounds and quantify compounds. So in the future, if you want to uh, uh, run the lipid phase sample as well, does that mean you need to add another into the standard? Or? We would have to come up with a way to um, add some sort of standard to the lipid phase. So right now, the lipid library for NMR doesn't exist. Um, there's, you know, there's data out there, there's knowledge out there about chemical shifts of lipids by NMR, so we can use that, but within like a software platform like Konomics, there, there's no lipid library. Can you create a lipid library by yourself? Can I create a lipid library by myself? I don't know, has someone talked about lipids yet? Um, there's a lot of lipids. Um, possibly for NMR we could um, because we're not going to de detect as many as we would by uh, some of the other analytical platforms, but it, it would be a cumbersome task for me to do it by myself. We're hoping to work with Konomics um, since they have the infrastructure to do that type of analytical work that I would, I think, would require some more elaborate and detailed testing to get to that point. Um, there's, there's no standard lipid library that I'm aware of for NMR at this point, and it, it would be, a, I think, a pretty hefty task for any one individual to take on. With an eye on time, I'm gonna ask a couple of our questions. I know okay. Thank you very much. <laughs>